So I say to you, there shall be joy before the angels of God upon one sinner doing penance. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. My dear brethren, as we know, the usual way by which somebody who falls away from the state of grace, falls into mortal sin, the usual way they come back to life again is through the sacrament of penance. There are two sacraments of the dead. One is baptism, and the other one is penance. All the other five sacraments are sacraments of the living, which means that we have to be in a state of grace to receive them. But penance is the sacrament for those who are already baptized, but who fall into sin. Not necessarily mortal sin, but any sin. It is one of the means by which God pours his life into the soul, one of the seven channels of grace into the soul. And this particular one, there to reestablish a life of grace when it has disappeared through sin, but also to strengthen the life of grace if we're not on mortal sin when we receive it. Now, regrettably, this sacrament is neglected very much by the modern church. There are few priests who make it a central or important part of their apostolate. And in many places, people don't go to confession. Many Catholics don't even realize that there is an obligation to go to confession at least once a year. So it is a regrettably a neglected apostolate, and it is a beautiful apostolate. Imagine in the street, if you by quick action, quick thinking and bravery, you saved somebody's life, pushed them out of the way of a bus. How elated that would make you feel, the fact that you had been God's instrument to save a life. For a priest, every time he sits in the confessional, he's saving life after life. All those who, who come in with mortal sins, they are dead, destined to hell for eternity, and then, in a few moments, with this sacrament, they are full of the divine life again. And it is a greater thing to restore a soul to grace than it is to save their life, their natural life here on earth. God, in his mercy, has given us this sacrament. He's also given us a number of saints to show us how important and how valuable is this sacrament and what veneration we should have toward it. Now, one of the greatest of these was Padre Pio. From the years 1918 to 1923, he heard confessions 15 to 19 hours a day. 15 to 19 hours a day. The average confession lasted only three minutes. And so, with a few with rough calculations, Somebody estimated that he'd heard over five million confessions in his lifetime. He commented on this, the fact that he spent a lot of his time in confession. He says, there have been periods when I heard confessions without interruption for 18 hours consecutively. I, mean, I, I feel that I've, I've done my thing sitting, sitting there for 45 minutes. I think, oh, that was a good day, good day of confessions. But 18 hours, even sitting down for 18 hours is hard. But to sit down 18 hours to hear confessions, extraordinary. He says, I don't have a moment to myself, but God helps me in this ministry. I feel the strength to announce everything. Now, to make a good confession, we need five things. There are five steps. First of all, we have to ask for the grace to make a good confession. We have to examine our conscience. There are different ways we can do this. My preferred way of examining conscience is to analyze all my duties towards God, my life of prayer, analyze my duties towards myself, and then my duties to my neighbor. So God, self, neighbor. Another way would be all the ways I've sinned in thought, in word, and in deed. That's another way. Another way of examining your conscience is taking the Ten Commandments and analyzing your conscience against those. But it's good to have a system. It doesn't matter which system you choose. Have a systematic way of examining your conscience rather than just 
putting your finger in the air and thinking, oh, what can I remember that I've done bad? Have, have a, a system. So we need to ask for the grace to make a good confession. We need to examine our conscience. We have to have contrition for our sins. Now, contrition is sorrow for our sin. Sorrow, it could be imperfect or perfect. Imperfect sorrow or imperfect contrition, as we say, is sorrow for our sins because we dread the loss of heaven and the pains of hell. That's imperfect contrition. But it's enough to have our sins forgiven. But what we need to have is perfect contrition, which is sorrow for our sins because we have wounded, offended he who is most lovable, he who loves us most. We have contributed to our blessed Lord's suffering on the cross. So when our blessed Lord was hanging on the cross, he would have recalled to his mind every one of our sins and say, I take this sin and I expiate this sin with my suffering. But in his mind, he would have remembered every one of our sins. And to have perfect contrition is to be sorry because we have made suffer our blessed Lord, who loves us more than we could ever know and who is more lovable than we could ever imagine. That's perfect contrition. So grace to see our sins, examination of conscience, perfect contrition. Contrition includes a firm purpose of amendment. That means not just having this vague desire, oh yes, I hope I don't have to confess this sin again. But it's, it's identifying a sin and saying, now, I've fallen into this sin time and time again. It's about time this stopped. So what is making me fall into this sin? What is the chain of events? What are the triggers to this sin? And once you identify, why am I falling into the sin? I'm looking for consolation or I'm bored. I've got the wrong friends or I've got this pastime, this habit. You know, I just can't stay off social media or films of one sort or another. I just got this habit. So you identify what are the occasions of the sin, what are the triggers for the sin, and then you make a plan. This is what I'm going to do differently now. This is what's going to change in my life. So I don't go down that same route, commit that same sin again and again and again. And so that's what a real firm purpose of amendment, which is actually necessary for the validity of the sacrament. The religious, the nuns and monks, they have two examinations of conscience every day. One at midday called a special examination of conscience and then the general one at the end of the day. And this is what the religious does in his special examination of conscience. They kneel down at midday for five minutes and they say, right, this sin, maybe it's um, resentful thoughts, rash judgment, very common sin, rash judgment, thinking ill of another without foundation assuming the worst of another. And so the religious would kneel down and say, right, is there any circumstance, any time today when I've entertained a, a malicious thought or an, an unkind thought towards a neighbor? Now, if there is, how has that happened? Right, I'm, and then they make an act of contrition and they, they, they form a plan for the next time. And by focusing on that sin, it will become less frequent and then eventually it will be eradicated. As I tell a lot of people in confession, Thomas Akempis, who wrote Imitation of Christ, he said, if we can get rid of just one sin every year of our life, just one, you've got a whole year to do it, get rid of one sin. He said, in no time you'd be a saint. In no time you'd be a saint. Now we, who are not religious, we don't take vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. We should examine our consciences at least once a day at the end of the day, a general examination of conscience. And in that general examination of conscience, we should particularly remember the sin that we are working to eradicate. Contrition, perfect contrition, includes a firm purpose of amendment. Then we have to confess our sins. And we have to confess our sins humbly, contritely, as in with sorrow for our sins, and sincerely telling it how it is, the truth. Now, a priest loves to hear a humble confession when somebody is not hiding anything or diminishing a sin in any way. We have to confess our sins sincerely. They're our sins. 
we take ownership of them, and we don't try and excuse ourselves in any way. The bigger the sin, confessed humbly, the more joy in the priest. I remember one time, long, long time ago, it was an old lady. I used to go and visit her every month, take Holy Communion. And it was a bit of a bind because I had a really busy job in the school. And it was probably about a three or four hour round trip. Anyway, I used to go and give her a confession, give her Holy Communion. And then we used to have a chat and a cup of tea afterwards. This particular time, I was having a cup of tea and, and we were having a, a jolly conversation. But just as I was about to go, she said, Father, can you hear my confession again? And I said, yes, certainly. Thought maybe there's a sin she'd forgotten. And then she opened up and she confessed a sin, a great mortal sin from 70 years before. And she was too ashamed to confess it. So she had lived a sacrilegious life for 70 years. All the sacraments she had received were sins because they were a sacrilege. And it was only maybe the thought that she hadn't much longer, maybe our delightful conversation we had together. There was some grace that touched her soul that made her call me back at the last moment. And so I, I heard a confession and gave her absolution. And driving back, it was almost as if I was floating back, the joy to be God's instrument, to return this sheep to the fold, never be afraid to tell the sins as they are. The priest will be overjoyed to reconcile a sinner to God. And then finally, the penitent, after having prayed to God to make a good confession, examine their conscience, having contrition for their sins, confessing their sins, they must perform the penance imposed upon them. Now, just a, a few anecdotes from the life of Padre Pio. He desired that his penitents had true contrition for their sins. And one woman said to him, she'd been reading immoral books. And Padre Pio said, have you confessed this before? She replied, yes. Padre Pio asked, what did your confessor say to you? Oh, he said, told me that I wasn't to do it anymore. Without a word, Padre Pio closed the confession door in her face and began to hear the next confession. So Padre Pio, he had the gift of reading into souls and he could see that she wasn't truly contrite. She wasn't sorry for a sin. One man said to Padre Pio in confession, but I'm attached to my sins. For me, they are a necessary part of life. Help me find a remedy. So Padre Pio handed him a prayer to St. Michael the Archangel to be recited every day for four months. That was a remedy for a mortal sin they were attached to. An unbelieving communist came into the confession, probably out of curiosity, or to show off, or to mock. At the time, he had still not abandoned his evil beliefs. Padre Pio chased him out of the confessional saying, what are you doing in front of God's tribunal? If you don't believe, go away. You are a communist. Now, if the penitent was not honest or just read through the list of his or her sins without firm purpose of amendment, Padre Pio would often growl, get out. Could read into souls, get out. A one woman asked about the soul of her husband who had died. Where is his soul, Padre? I haven't slept worrying. Padre Pio replied, your husband's soul is condemned forever. Condemned? Padre Pio sadly nodded. When receiving the last sacraments, he concealed many sins. He had neither repentance nor a good resolution. He was also a sinner against God's mercy because he said he wanted to have a share of the good things in life and then have time to be converted to God at the end. One time Padre Pio was asked, we confess everything that we can remember or know, but what happens if God sees other things that we cannot recall? Padre Pio replied, if we put into our confession all our good will, we have the intention to confess all that we can know or remember. The mercy of God is so great that he will include and erase even that which we cannot remember. That's important to know. If you go to confession and you confess everything comes to mind, 
and then later on you remember a mortal sin that you didn't confess, or you remember from your youth or years past a mortal sin you haven't confessed, don't fret. It's not just because you remembered a sin that you suddenly fall out of grace, you fall into mortal sin again, no. If you've sincerely wished to confess all mortal sins in your confession, then all mortal sins are effaced. They're washed away. If you remember an unconfessed mortal sin, you remain in a state of grace, but you should confess it at the next confession. You don't need to, to knock on the priest's door in the middle of the night saying, Father, I remembered a mortal sin. You can wait till the next usual confession, and that's sufficient. So no, never fret. The church is a gentle mother to us. Our blessed Lord loves us. He sees our soul truly. He's not out there to damn us. On the contrary, he died to save as many of us as possible. Other requirements for confession. Modest dress. Padre Pio was very strong on modesty. He would dismiss women from the confessional even before they got inside if he discerned their dress inappropriate. Many mornings he drove out one after the other, ending up hearing only very few confessions. Women who managed to enter the confessional dressed somewhat improperly were ordered out by Padre Pio, with him sometimes shouting, out, out, out. I've never had to do that, unfortunately. <laughs> Padre Pio considered going to confession frequently to be something necessary for the growth in spiritual life. He went to confession at least once a week, and he never wanted his spiritual children to, to go without confession more than 10 days. So I think general advice is everyone should go at least once a month. And then if possible, every two weeks, that's really ideal. It's really ideal. Because it's not just a place where you do the house cleaning. You get rid of your sins. It's a place where God pours his life into your soul and become more intimately united to our blessed Lord. He lives in you through this sacrament. It's a beautiful sacrament. Finally, nobody likes going to confession. Even, even if you haven't got any mortal sins, or you haven't even got any big sins, nobody likes going to confession. Nobody likes admitting that they are sinners. But remember, every time you go to confession, the moment you step out of the confessional, if you made a good confession, your heart is lifted up. Not only by grace, but also by the natural feelings of relief, also the joy that you have been able to share and unburden yourself from sin. So let us ask the grace through the hands of the Blessed Virgin Mary, who incidentally never did go to confession. She would never have had matter for confession, so she would have never received the sacrament of penance. But all the graces pass through her hands. Let us ask her that we may have a love of this sacrament and may frequent it, never being afraid to enter into the presence of God and to pour out our sorrow at his feet, at his throne. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.